Are we just singing a song? Or does somebody want to magnify them? We magnify you. We glorify you. We lift you up right now. We've been waiting all week long to praise your name in the midst of the saints. And if I hold my peace, the very rocks will cry out. But I made up my mind no rocks going to cry out in my place. Magnify the Lord. Open your mouth. Clap your hands. And magnify the God of all creation. You are worthy. 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 Worthy is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world to receive majesty, dominion, and power. I magnify your name. I'm not ashamed today to give you praise. Take complete control of everything that goes on. I'd be remiss today if I didn't thank you for waking me up this morning, having me in my right mind, have the activity of my limbs, walk around, I have food to eat, clothes to wear, a roof over my head, I'm saved today, and therefore you are worthy of praise. Now open our hearts to a fresh revelation of your word. We might be able to process it in our minds and live it out in our lives. And we'll give your name the praise. It is in Jesus' name that we pray and we give thanks. Somebody say praise God. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Go ahead and tell them how nice they're looking next to you right now. Did you get that dress just for the day? My God, you look good. Where people of color are being told to go back where they come from and being targeted by shooters and the suicide rate is going up, we might need to talk to God. And I wanna talk to you about a hotline to heaven by using a metaphor from the Cold War. The Cold War is now over, so they say. But back in August of 1963, because of the fear of nuclear annihilation, there was a so-called hotline established between Moscow and Washington, an important communication link between the two nuclear superpowers of the United States and the Soviet Union. The hotline came into being one year after the Cuban Missile Crisis, a confrontation over the presence of Soviet missiles in Cuba brought the world to the brink of nuclear conflict. And after diplomacy and cooler heads prevailed both sides, were shaken by the realization of how close they had come to annihilation and how primitive their direct methods of communication had been. After the crisis passed, President John F. Kennedy suggested the hotline to the Soviets. And contrary to popular myth and Hollywood portrayal, the hotline has never been a pair of red telephones, one in the drawer of the Oval Office and the other in the Kremlin. But we shall use that popular image, at least for this sermon. At first it was a set of teletypes with messages punched in at the rate of about one page every three minutes. The system was replaced in the late, late 1970s with two satellite systems as well as an undersea cable link. Would you just, you haven't talked to your neighbor yet, have you? Would you just touch him and say, Jeopardy's coming? You're getting information that you might need on Jeopardy. The American end of the hotline is not located in the White House but across the Potomac in the Pentagon at the National Military Command Center. When the hotline is used, a message from the president is sent by coded phone, electronic transmission, or messenger from the White House to the command center, and the center's officer in charge contacts the White House to verify the message. Once verified, the message is then encoded and sent to Moscow. The hotline uses a written word rather than voice or video transmission. It was originally thought that the text would reduce the chance of improper translation of an urgent message. It would also give each side time to consider the other message 
before replying and would avoid a person's body language or tone of voice from being misinterpreted. The translation is always done on the other end to preserve the nuance, says Pentagon spokesperson, Lieutenant Colonel David Thurston. Hopefully you've received enough information to get that question right on Jeopardy or to understand the need for a hotline between Moscow and the Kremlin. As you think about the hotline, can you envision any important reasons for a hotline to heaven? If you can, I can. There are times in my life, times of crisis, confusion, and depression, despair when I need to get directly to my heavenly father, the great superpower of heaven. And what we see going on in our nation, if we've ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him right now. Of course, we have the communication medium of prayer, but at certain times, prayer alone can seem a rather indirect way of communicating with Abba Father, not to mention the fact that prayer can sometimes be delayed. There are times when our prayers seem to be trapped by the ceiling. There are times when our prayers don't seem to get directly to heaven, or it seems they're being processed through the switchboard of other departments of heaven before they reach God. In addition, these circumstances, there are times I need to talk directly to the Abba Father because of our relationship and because of our fellowship. And those in the office know we've never had a discussion. There, there is no policy. There are no procedures. But if my wife calls, they put her directly through because of our relationship because of our fellowship. I've never told anybody out there, and if it's my wife, put it through. They just know to do that. Wouldn't it be great if when you call heaven, they put you through? They didn't pass you over to the archangel or pass you around, but put you straight through to God Almighty. Well, I got good news for you. There is a hotline to heaven. And today, I'm going to show you how to pick up the red phone. The hotline in heaven is covered in three specific scriptures, possibly in Romans 8.26, but we're not going to cover that scripture because of clarity and possible controversy. We'll take those scriptures where it's rather straightforward. The first one will be 1 Corinthians 14.14. 14. Do y'all feel like standing today? We just stand once, and then you can sit down for the rest of them. If you cannot stand, that is fine. You honor the Lord in your heart. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I shall pray with the spirit, and I shall pray with the mind also. I shall sing with the spirit, and I shall sing with the mind also. May the Lord have the blessing of the reading of his holy word. Go ahead and be seated. I taught this stuff all before in a series called The Tongues Trilemma. Some of you didn't get that because you quit and went home during that period. Some of the folks who uh, wouldn't even hear when I taught that, so I've been going back and just refreshing our memory on some of these uh, sermons on the Holy Ghost. I preached three or four, and folks were coming up to me and saying, keep on preaching that, keep on preaching. So I've been stuck here. I think this is going to be my last sermon, but I'm, let's go into it a little bit. To deal with the subject, I've got to reset the context of the discussion First of all, hardly any modern scholars anymore still hold to the position that the Bible teaches a cessation of the, fan, of, the, of the spiritual gifts or the manifestations of 1 Corinthians 12. There are some who are still holding out from the old school and they're fundamentalists, some evangelicals who will never change. But many of the scholars have gone on and changed now. And although there is a great deal of disagreement over the uses of the phanaresis, it is becoming more and more accepted that they are still in operation. This is more difficult to maintain that they have ceased, particularly since we got 600 million tongue-speaking folks worldwide. Secondarily, tongues has been one of the most controversial subjects in the church, has been. I used to wonder why, but I'm beginning to understand that more and more. Something as important as these manifestations of the Spirit would certainly be attacked and mystified by the devil, and that's exactly what he's done. In addition, in some circles, there is a stigma or a shame in dealing with the things of the Holy Ghost. 
In his book, The Anointing, R.T. Kendall discusses the point that the stigma of Jehovah is his sovereignty. The stigma of Christ is the cross, and we preached a sermon series on that, or the blood. But the stigma of the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost himself. Since tongues is one of the manifestations of the Spirit, there is often a stigma or a shame in dealing with this particular manifestation. Uh, thirdly, you know, we, don't, we are scientific people. We're not uh, supernatural people. So tongues kind of mystify, scares us. We're not sure what to do. And then fourthly, there's misinformation that clouds our ability to deal with the subject. Once again, R.T. Kendall wrote in The Anointing, the paramount stigma uh, of, of, of today's man and woman is probably that of being misunderstood. If there's anything that bothers us today, I don't want to be misunderstood. And there is an anointing that is largely past. There is one that is present, and there's an anointing for tomorrow. There is a yesterday's anointing, a today's anointing, and a tomorrow's anointing. And the stigma of today's anointing or today's man or woman is being misunderstood. I believe I've got today's anointing, and that I'm going to continue, and therefore I will be misunderstood. That is one of the costs of the fresh anointing of God. Now, there's one thing you need to understand, that a lot of people, what, what makes, they come up to me and they say, Bishop, uh, some folks are particularly, you know, you have an anointing on your life. That's the greatest uh, compliment you could ever pay me. Not that I speak good or whatever, but that got anointing. And by the way, anointing will cost you something. I don't know if you know it, but you can't purchase the anointing down at Walmart. You can't get a, a can of it over at, 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 at Target. You have to pay for it with your life and your spirit experience and what you go through. Be that as it may, let the record be straight before I jump into this to set the context of what I did teach and what I didn't teach. I have simply taught that tongues, as one of the manifestations of the Spirit, is still in operation. I have never taught that any, anyone needs to speak in tongues to be saved. I have never taught that anyone needs to speak in tongues to be filled with the Spirit. Um, although tongues is likely to be one of the manifestations of the Spirit accompanying the Lucan or the baptism in the Holy Ghost. I've never taught that anyone who does not speak in tongues is not complete in Christ. I've never taught that anyone who has not spoken in tongues uh, or those who have have reached some exalted state that is better than those who haven't spoken in tongues. Because I've seen some tongue speakers that you wouldn't want to be like. But I, I've never taught that just because you spoke in tongues, you're up on top now. I, I, I have never taught that one needs to put his spiritual or, or life on hold and seek tongues until you receive. I've never taught that tongues should just be spoken in church without any regard to biblical limitations, interpretation, and explanation. I have taught that there are two different kinds of tongue. The grace of tongue that I believe is available to all believers and the gift of tongues which is given by the Spirit to various members of the community for messages that require interpretation. But the, there's something that is not available necessarily to everyone. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the hotline to heaven. One of the reasons I want to discuss the hotline is because as quiet as it's kept, some people in here do have the grace of spiritual language, and some people don't know what to do with it. Some folks sought for it, but other folks, they didn't seek for it. They were just, just praising God, and it fell on them. And so we need to figure out, what do I do with what I got? 1 Corinthians 14, let's go back. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Paul stated here that what he, when he prayed in tongues, his spirit prayed, but his mind was, all fruit, all was fruit, unfruitful. Paul had already admonished the Corinthians about praying in tongues in the assembly without interpretation or without explanation. He is giving instruction on how to more wisely deal with tongues. And from this verse, we get that term that you've heard used, prayer language, because the Greek is literally a prayed in a language. When Paul prays in tongue, even though his mind is unfruitful, his human spirit is energized by the Holy Ghost, and he prays to God. And since God is, as to his nature, spirit, this is spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. Somebody say spirit-to-spirit. -spirit. Spirit to spirit. Now, no doubt you have heard about body language. Touch your neighbor, see if they're alive. I don't know. Are they, are they alive? Don't pinch them hard, but just see if they're here. 
body language, we communicate by the postures that we assume. Uh, I know you know about verbal language, the communication between people and by the spoken word that takes place from mind to mind, soul to soul, personality to personality. Written language is communicated through the written symbols and is an intellectual means of communication. But for a moment, I'm trying to get you to think about spirit to spirit communication, the direct communication between us and God, the hotline that is not as easily hindered by thoughts, emotion, home of origin issues, or satanic attacks. Bump your neck neighbor. So I think he just said something there. How many of you try to pray every now and then? Let's just see. Try to pray. God bless you. Two or three of y'all. God bless you. When you try to pray, sometimes your thoughts will hinder you. You're trying to pray, but it seems like you just can't get that whopper out your mind. Burger King just all in there. You're trying to pray, but sometimes things invade your mind. I'm looking for a witness up in here. Your emotions can block your prayers. If you're very angry about something that happened, it can stop your prayer and keep you from getting through to God. Home of origin issues can mess you up. I'm always afraid when I talk about God the Father that people who have not had a good father are having difficulty interacting with the image of God Almighty. And then satanic attacks. Do you know that when you talk and you say certain things and the devil hears you talking, he pretty smart. Maybe he could just go ahead and figure out, I know how to attack that right there because I heard what they said. I'm going to try to eat right this year. I heard the devil say, well, well, let me, I, I heard that. And he will attack you. I'm not hearing nobody's talking about nothing. But Jack Hafer talks about father speak, family communication, a form of communication that is deeply intimate between the father and his children. When families are close, they have forms of communication that other people cannot pick up on. Is it ought not to be the same with our Abba Father? When I was a child at home, my mother didn't have to do a whole lot of stuff. She just gave me a look. She didn't say, I'm going to kill you when you get home. She didn't say nothing. She didn't went like this. And all that needed to be communicated was communicated in that one look. And so we ought to be that kind of communication with God. The question that often confuses us people is how, does, how do tongues communicate to God when the mind is unfruitful? In America, we often believe that Christianity is rationality and textuality, but God is not bound by human thought, nor human language, nor human understanding, nor human books, even the Bible. God is infinitely greater than our thoughts, than our language, than our understanding, and even the Bible, and therefore he can speak beyond our thoughts thoughts, known languages, or understanding, and the Bible. It doesn't seem that people can figure it out, that the, we, the, God's been talking to people as long as there have been people, and they've been a Bible all that time. The Bible remains the supreme source of the God's holy word for those of us who are evangelicals, but God is greater than the book, and, the, and he's greater than that because he's God-breathed and greater than that and greater than vessel. And you know, this book, I don't want to get in trouble here today because I don't want you to quit the church just yet, but, but this is God's word in human words. If you read it carefully enough, you'll have some issues because man is involved in the process, and anytime people get involved, you got a problem. It's still God's word. Once Jack Hafer called the grace of tongues prayer language, transrational language, trans above. The tongues are not irrational, they're transrational. They are beyond the rational, beyond the mind. The spirit is a higher faculty for communicating with God than the mind. There are two other terms for describing these kinds of tongues, preconceptual and precognitive. The word cognitive has to do with knowledge or reasoning. The word conceptual has to do with conceptualizing something in your mind. The two are close, so we'll, we'll con discuss them as one. Precognitive, preconceptual language is language that is spoken directly to God. No one understands the actual syllables, but his spirit is speaking mysteries. The person's mouth opens out of the depth of his or her spirit before the mind can conceives or conceptualizes the idea of the words. American people are going to have a hard time with that because they want to think through everything. And they ought to be all messed up right now with what's going on in our country because everything is crazy. 
All of that's interesting, but it's irrelevant to the point. What's the point, Brother Pastor? The point is praying in tongues is a hotline to heaven, a direct line from our spirit to God's spirit. Now, if you don't need that, you just sit there and let, and, and, and let us praise God. Because there's some of us here that we know there are times we need to get to God directly. Paul's admonition in the next verse is instruction, instructive. He says, I pray with my spirit, but I pray with my mind also. He could be saying, I pray in tongues and I give the interpretation. That's a possibility with the vocabulary. But it also seems possible that he's saying, I pray in tongues with previous instructions, and then I pray with my mind, understandable language in the assembly. In the statement, Paul acknowledges the importance of praying in the spirit or praying in tongues, but cautions the Corinthians about how you use it in the assembly. We would think, if you listen to folks today, all he talked about was the caution. No, he's talking about how to handle what God has given. So in that short passage, we see biblical terminology for praying in tongue, praying in the spirit, and praying in the tongue is a hot line to heaven. Can I go on? Okay, to the six of y'all who are here. Ephesians 6.18, the second place in the Bible, the topic is touched on. Ephesians 6.18, you don't need to stand. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. With this in view, be on the alert with perseverance and petition for all the saints. Doesn't need much cooperation because we have the same author using the same words, pray at all times in the spirit. But the exhortation does need a little explanation. If this is prayer in tongues, which I believe it is, how can you pray all time at in tongue? Are we to walk around continually praying in tongues? I don't think that's exactly what he's saying. But he could be talking about the attitude of prayer and praying intermittently in our minds. He exhorts the Thessalonians again, pray without ceasing. Or the words are more literally, pray incessantly, like an incessant call. This is the concept of the Negro spiritual that states, every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. I can see today, I ain't got no Negroes in this, in this, in this audience. In the, in the first service, all I did was start, and everybody was, feel that, every time I feel the spirit in my, moving my heart, I will pray. I guess that's where all the Negroes are. Y'all don't seem to understand or know about the Negro spiritual. Yet it seems to me praying in the spirit it is in tongues because although the terms are differently used a little differently, it's the same term. Praying in the spirit or one's human spirit can be the same when your human spirit is filled with the Holy Spirit. I think the answer to the question is in the meaning of the word time. And I'm going to take a little time with time because I want you to understand something and I don't want you to think I pulled this out of thin air. The word is kairos and it means a primitive word that's used to translate times or seasons. It's the right time. It's the opportune time. It's a limited period of time. It's what time brings about. I don't want you to think that I just pulled this out. Can I move a little bit? The biblical analysis research tool of the NAV Press biblical software translates the phrase praying at every time in the spirit. We ought to pray in the spirit at every time and every season on every occasion. The biblical commentary, knowledge commentary, says when the enemy attacks and on all occasions, Christians ought to pray continually in the spirit, in the power, and in the sphere of the spirit. The commentary critical and explanatory on the whole Bible says, I'm going to give you a little, so you understand, I didn't just make this up. It says implying opportunity in every season, in exigency or urgent need. Matthew Henry, you know about him, don't you? He said, we must pray upon all occasions as often as our, as our own and other necessities call for it. This means Paul is saying, pray in the spirit on every important occasion in every season of opportunity concerning every urgent need. All right, we got a hotline to heaven and praying in tongue ought to be done on all occasions in every decisive season. We ought to pray on important occasions. We ought to pray on unimportant occasions. We ought to pray about everything. We ought to pray about going to the store. We ought to pray in the doctor's office. We ought to pray while we're driving. We ought to pray while we're shopping. In short, we ought to pray on all occasions. Pick up the red phone. 
I don't think people are praying anymore because they don't know how to pray. Do you think the nation would be looking like it was looking if we was praying like we ought to be praying? We ought to pray in the spirit in every season of life, in summer, in spring, in winter, in the fall, in the dog days of summer, in the rainy seasons of spring. We ought to pray in good times and in bad times. We ought to use the hotline upon every need for power, for direction, for deliverance, for protection. We need to call on God and pray in the Holy Ghost. It's just like the hotline from Washington to Moscow. We got a hotline to keep in direct communication with the Father when we face all season, all needs, everything that's going on. Keep in mind, you don't need to get on the hotline necessarily and broadcast it in church, although we might do that periodically speaking, sure. The hotline is for personal, important occasion and season. The Holy Ghost will come. The, the, the Pentecostal people used to say, Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. Call him up. Call him up. Tell him what you want. You have to call Jesus sometime. And he will come. The reason you're not getting what you need is that you don't, you're not praying in the spirit on all occasions. I'm just telling you what it said. Now, some folks get all messed up because they think, uh, well, you know, do, do, should I, uh, you know, Paul gives some instruction because when you're praying in the spirit, we're going to talk in a little bit about you're praying to God. You're not praying to folks around you. So you pray up, you pray, you, you speak up, you speak down in your vault, you do that. You're not speaking from side to side trying to give anybody a message. You're speaking to God because that's your direct line to heaven. And so we, don't, we can do that a little more now. I, I recognize that a lot of us come out of evangelicalism, and that messes us up. We don't know how to go forward. You know, people are speaking in tongue. I was, I was at the uh, network of local churches on Thursday night speaking there, and, 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 and the apostle just said, let's move in our prayer, prayer languages right now. And everybody just starts speaking in tongues. Let's move in. Let's press in. Let's pray. I will never do that here. Too many evangelicals. They don't understand. They don't want to see that kind of thing. It frightens them. The emotion frightens them. And yet the Bible is full of that kind of emotion, full of that kind of stuff. And as quiet as it's kept, black people is too. We've just lost a lot of it. But what you see going on in the nation round, you're going to need Jesus before this is all over. You're going to need him. You're going to need him. Brother Caldwell said, take the Lord God with you everywhere you go. You're going to need him one day, and you'll be able to call. And guess what? Call him up and tell him what you want. I'm glad that he's on the main line. Sometimes I ain't even got to call him. He's waiting on me in order to answer and give me what I need. I got a hot line to heaven, and I feel like preaching just a little bit. Hallelujah. Y'all messed up, but I'm going back to the old landmark. I'm going to take the bars off the doors, open up the windows, because you need to go back maybe to the Mona's bin, because you're going to need something to make it through where you are right now. I said, you're going to need something. You're going to need the Holy Ghost to help you to walk through situations. And when you end up walking in the world that we live in now and get all tarnished and messed up, you're going to need the Holy Ghost to help you to be able to live like God wants you to live. Let me hurry on because I'm just preaching to myself. Let's go to the third occasion. Jude 1 and 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. The language is almost identical to that in 1 Corinthians 14 and 14 and Ephesians 6, 18. So there's little doubt that Jude is talking about praying in tongues, but he gives a different perspective. He connects praying in the Holy Ghost with building ourselves up on our most holy faith. And so Jude describes Christians as the beloved of God who build themselves up on their faith by praying in tongues. How does praying in the Holy Ghost build us up? Does it not build you up to know that you got a direct line? to the God of the universe? Does it not build you up to get in touch with your father and to hear back from him? Does it not build you up to be buoyed up in the spirit, being able to face whatever you got to face? 
This is not the first time the Bible talked about tongues and edification. Back in 1 Corinthians 14 and 4, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. In one of the most foremost commentaries, uh, recognized commentaries of 1 Corinthians, recognized by both Pentecostals and Evangelicals, Gordon Fee writes, and I quote, this has sometimes been called self-edification and therefore viewed as pejorative, disapproved of, or criticized. Let me stop for a minute in my quote and just say pejorative. Let's learn a new word. Go ahead, try it out pejorative. So when people start talking about tongues, what we've heard is it's pejorative. You want to build yourself up, there's something wrong with that. You want to build yourself up, you must have some problems with yourself that you need that. But he writes, and I continue to quote, Paul intended no such thing. The edifying of oneself is not self-centeredness, but personal edifying of the believer that comes through private prayer and praying. And although one may wonder how mysteries that are not understood even by the speaker can edify the answer lies in the verses that we're looking at. Contrary to opinion of many, spiritual edification can take place in ways other than through the cortex of your brain. Paul believed in an immediate communing with God by means of the Spirit that sometimes bypassed the mind. And in verses 14 through 15, he argues that for his own edification, he will have both. But in the church, he will be careful to speak with his mind. There is a specific kind of edification that comes from spirit to spirit communication. Communicating with our loving Father builds us up, edifies us, brings us closer to God, makes us feel special, brings immediate results. Somebody pick up the red phone and start saying, Father, I love you. Father, I thank you for what you've done for me. Father, Thank you for being the kind of God that you are. Pick up the red phone. Because you might need some edification. When I came back from the, uh, the speaking this week, I called two of my mentees who were there as I spoke. And they began to share with me the impact of my message. They say, after you left, everybody was talking about what you were speaking. They were still bringing it up. Other speakers were talking about it. And I stopped them for a minute. I said, let me just share something with you. I need to know that. I need to hear that. I, I know that this is the house of the Lord. And, in, and even over there, sometimes, if you look at me and you look at me very carefully, I look self-sufficient. Like, I don't need no help. I don't need no encouragement. I'm a man, and I need some encouragement every now and then. I need somebody to say, uh, keep on going, uh, Pastor. We, we love you. I, I need somebody to build me up every now and then. So I said, go ahead. Tell me some more about what they said. You say they say what? They did what? Because I need to be built up. Does anybody here need to be built up? If you go out in the world and you got a job and you got to go out and work in the workaday world and have that stuff rub off on you, you need to be built up. But guess what? When nobody else won't build you up, you can build yourself up. Glory! In the Holy Ghost, you can just start praying. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And it will build you up in the Holy Ghost. I want you to know that you don't have to wait until you get to church. You could be sitting in the doctor's office and build yourself up. You ain't got to bother nobody, but you can just put your head down where nobody can see you. And I'm about Shanda Labo say. And God will begin to move in the doctor's office. You can go in the grocery store. You can go anywhere and you don't have to be messed up and nobody don't have to even know what you're saying. But you can begin to praise and honor God and magnify him and release heaven on your behalf. Somebody ought to pick up the red phone and know that it's a hotline between here and heaven. And every now and then, I got to call on Jesus. He will answer prayer. And we wonder what the problem is. We don't have no power. Now Paul said, I'm almost dead. 
in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, although it's been taken pejoratively. Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Now we jumped that, skipped that. Let's jump over to, but in the Bible, but in my church, I, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's, let's deal with what he said. I speak in tongues more than all y'all. It's important to me. I do it all the time. When I was making the switch from evangelicalism to mid, I call it mid-charismatic teachings, and I went, we went out to, to hear Jack Hayford, and, and Jack Hayford came and, and helped me out in my transition when it was going kind of bad and wrote the foreword to my book. It was there that Jack Hayford did a lot of teaching, and Jack Hayford said something that kind of caught my attention and remains fragrant in my memory. He said, you know, I speak in tongue every day. Every day. And I'm trying to think of the house of the Lord, people. Uh, God bless you in your transition from evangelicalism to, um, to wherever it is you at. But you might speak in tongues every now and then, a little bit here and there and over and in. But Jack Haber said, no, I speak in tongues. I need to build myself up every day. Oh! Every day I need to get in my closet of prayer and build until I'm ready to go out and face what the devil is doing. Because this is a warfare. Anybody figured it out yet? It's a warfare. And if you don't have warfare too, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power, wickedness in high places. This is a spiritual warfare. And you can't fight the devil with that natural stuff. You're going to need the spiritual warfare tool. Every now and then, you're going to need to speak in tongues. Hallelujah. Every now and then, you're going to need to call him up. Like the Pentecostal folks used to say, call him up, call him up. Tell him what you want. He's on the main line. He will answer prayer. If you call on Jesus, he will answer prayer. Now, y'all don't know that. Singing until it get down in you. The reason sometimes we can't get nowhere is because we are the new church and we know you don't want to stay in worship too long so we don't let them sing but a short while so that you won't get too messed up. Because in the Pentecostal church, they'll sing a song until they either get on you or you quit. Either get down inside of you or you're so tired you just go ahead and just sit down as I can't take it. Sing until it gets down in your spirit, down in your soul, down in your bones because you're going to need Jesus wherever you go and whatever you do. But if you're singing long enough, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. After a while, you'll stop. You won't have to make up nothing. You won't have to try to drudge up a shout. You won't have to try to get up something. We come and we try to pump people and get them up to come on as anybody here that wants Jesus. And we're trying to pump a dry well. Do you know him? Can you come on? Please come and shout and come to Jesus. But ain't nothing down there, so you ain't doing nothing but pumping a dry well. If you had the Holy Ghost on the inside, you would be ready to shout and praise God at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together, for he is worthy of praise, majesty, dominion, and power. Oh, come on, somebody, and shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Magnify his name, and the devil will run out of here like he's scared because of the power of God Almighty. Come on and praise him just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, la la bosha, la la bosha, no shondo la la bosha, he la la bosha. Every now and then, I, I just go ahead and use my hot my hot line frequently. I just go ahead and press into it sometimes, so I can get God's attention. Are you up there? Do you hear me? Because every now and then I wonder, is he up there? Or, and I, but I pray just right. He'll come down and he'll touch. So let's use our hotlines. 
Now, if you're around people and, they're, and you're at the house of the Lord and you don't think they understand, just, just hold it down. But you ain't got to stop. They ain't stopping what they doing. You ain't got to stop. Just cut it down a little bit. They coming down the street, uh, you know, in their car, and they ain't stopping. Huh? They bumping all the way. To boom, 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 boom. We come to church. I, I don't want to get nobody upset. So I, I, I didn't know because people, you know, how, how they be at. And uh, sometimes I just go ahead. I, I, I try to hold it down. But sometimes I just go ahead and magnify the Lord because he's been too good to me. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I had to go through this week. Therefore, you don't have a right to judge my praise. I praise him like I want to, because I'm still a free country, I think. Every now and then, I go ahead and magnify him, who brought me out of Zion. Yes, thank you, Lord. Oh, glory. Now's the day of salvation. You ought to come to him while you can. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you do not know him, I want you to know him. The reason I'm up here exercising and jumping and hollering is because I want you to know Jesus. He died for you. He came to set you free. He came to wrestle you out of the hands of the devil and from death and hell. All you got to do is say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for every sin that I've sinned against you. Come in my life. Save me. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and for giving me the gift of eternal life. I receive you as Savior and Lord. I pray that in a minute. That's what God will do for you. You need a church home. We want to give you that opportunity. But I believe there's some folks today, after today, you say, I, I, I want the Holy Ghost. And I, I would like to have that grace of tongues. We don't need to seek, you don't need to seek tongues, you need to seek the Spirit. The tongues will come, they will take care of themselves. But I do think you need to sometimes tell God what you want. So I'm going to pray for some people today. You'll say, I, I'm one of those, I, I want you. I'm not going to even ask you to raise your hand or stand up about that or anything like that because I don't want you to be messed up or people to see what you, I just want you to be able to say, I want the Holy Ghost like I've never wanted him before. At the same time, and just after we do that, I'm going to pray about this all-white Sunday. You know, I remember when God said to me, and he, I'm not one of those people God speaks to a lot, so he speaks to me in the word all the time, but he, I, not a lot of extra words, but, so I'm not as spiritual as some of y'all, but every now and then he does speak to me. At one time he said, can you preach to people's souls while their bodies go to hell? And I said, no, Lord, I can't do that. And I began to press in and start to talk more about holistic Christianity. Diabetes is an epidemic in the United States and in the African-American community. Every 17 seconds, someone is diagnosed with diabetes. The seventh leading, seventh leading cause of death in the United States. And African-Americans are almost twice as likely to be diagnosed with diabetes as their white counterparts. In addition, we are more likely to suffer complications such as end-stage renal disease and lower extremity amputations. You can develop diabetes at any age. However, it occurs most often in the middle age in older people. And you're more likely to develop diabetes if you're 45 or older, have a family history, of diabetes or you're overweight. The risk factors are overweight or obesity, physical inactivity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. 
Research shows that you can greatly reduce your risk for type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes by eating a healthy diet, getting plenty of physical activity, and losing excess weight. If you already have diabetes, you can manage it by monitoring your blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol, quit smoking, lifestyle changes that include planning healthy meals, limiting calories, being physically active, taking the prescribed medicines, a part of your managing your diabetes. Here at the House of the Lord, we have the Monica Gardner Legacy Diabetes Ministry, which works to educate us in developing healthy lifestyle, managing diabetes, reducing controllable risks. There's a table in the foyer. If you would stop by at the end, they will give you some information. You can attend the next diabetes class. If you're struggling with diabetes or pre-diabetes, I'm going to pray for you today. Now, there's some folks here who, as I preach, the Holy Spirit touched you and you said, I want that. I'm going to ask you just to put your head back, open your mouth, and begin to praise God. I'm going to pray that he feel you and give you that which you desire. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now. Let your spirit flow from on high among your folks. And as you fill their hearts with your spirit, may the language that comes along with it be released unto them. I thank you today that you have given us a hotline to heaven that was poured out on the day of Pentecost and thereafter so that we might have access to the throne room in the name of Jesus. Now I need you to praise God. I need you to open your mouth and begin to praise him just a little bit. Open your mouth and begin to say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for filling me with the Holy Ghost. Lord, I thank you for the language that you are giving me. Lord, I thank you for blessing me with this gift. And I want you to praise him right now. Don't play. I need you to praise him. I need you to open your mouth until God begins to fill in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to allow you to help them just a minute. If you got the spiritual language, go ahead and use it for just a moment as we help those folks who are pressing their way into the throne room, trying to get a hold of something from God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. You ought to thank him right there. Thank you for filling me. Thank you. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for what you're doing in my life. Thank you for giving me a hotline. Thank you. Glory to God. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want the spirit to be here because I'm getting ready to pray for miracles right now. I'm getting ready to pray for miracles. We need the spirit in the room. You got diabetes and you are not ashamed. Go ahead and stand on your feet wherever you are all over the house. I'm struggling with diabetes. I got pre-diabetes. I'm having issues. Stand up right now wherever you are. I'm struggling. I, I'm not sure what to do. I'm about to pray for you that God would do something. If you were already standing, you're going to get prayed for too, so you should have sat down. If you find somebody standing, I need you to get around them right now. Ask them, can I lay hands on you? I'm going to deputize you. I need to lay hands. Can I lay hands? Is it all right? I don't want anybody standing alone. I want, I want you to be able to touch and lay hands on somebody. Don't let anybody stand alone. Don't let anybody stand alone. We belong a part of a fellowship where we lay hands on folks and they shall recover. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He's in the room to heal. He's in the room to deliver. He's in the room to set free. I'm about to pray. Do you believe it's going to happen? I said, do you believe it's going to happen? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray now for those who we are laying hands on. I pray that you would help them with their discipline. I pray that you would help them with their eating habits. I pray you would encourage them in the midst of all that is going on. But even more so, I pray for supernatural healing in their midst. The next time they go back to the doctor, Lord, I wanna see better numbers. I wanna see that you have done something in their life 
in the name of Jesus. Ward off complications. Ward off renal failure. Ward off amputation. Heal in the name of Jesus. I believe that you are a God of healing. Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord thy God that healeth thee. Why don't you call his name? Now, if you want healing, you got to start to praise God for it right now. You got to start to thank him and say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for healing me. Thank you. He's in the room. I sense him in the room right now. He's in the room. He's in the room. He's healing somebody. He's straightening out something. He's dealing with that blood pressure. He's regulating some stuff. Hallelujah. Thank you for what you're doing. Don't stop. Press into it. Don't stop. Praise him until you get what you want. Don't stop. All right, while the choir is coming, you finish your praise. Let God know that you thank him for what he's done.